Tonight, hour of need. Gaza sees more airdrops from supporting nations, but the situation remains dire as rations dry out against high demand. New bonds. China welcomes renewed collaboration with Russia as the nation hopes to improve on already existing partnerships with the rest of the world. Modi makes a move. With elections looming ever closer, Indian Prime Minister Modi makes a visit to the contentious area of Srinagar for the first time since revoking its special status. And Art Dubai. Cutting-edge tech meets human nuance as artists put on their best pieces on display in one of the most impressive exhibitions till date in Dubai. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and welcome to World News. Thank you very much for tuning in today as well. We're nearing the end of yet another week and we hope we've given you plenty of updates on the happenings of the world so far. But we have more of the same for you here tonight and we begin with updates on Palestine. In northern Gaza, long queues of desperately hungry women and children lined up at a street kitchen in great need of a meal. Up to 300,000 Palestinians are now believed to remain in northern Gaza, even though Israel had ordered the evacuation of the entire region in October. They have been left with dwindling pre-war food supplies and only trickles of aid entering from the south via Egypt. They have received barely any aid in weeks, causing the UN to warn of impending famine. The World Food Program halted deliveries to the north of Gaza on February 20th after its convoy of trucks faced gunfire and looting. It tried to resume deliveries this week, only to have its trucks turned away by Israel. As a last resort, countries such as the United States, France and Jordan have started airdropping aid into Gaza although many deliveries have been reported as falling into the sea or Israeli territories. Regardless, the airdrops only contain supplies for a small percentage of the population. The UN said on Wednesday that roads are the only way to transport the large quantities of food needed to avert famine. The UN added that it was working with Israel to reach a deal that would allow aid convoys to use a military road to reach northern Gaza. Meanwhile, in updates to yet another conflict, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Greek Prime Minister Kriakos Mitostakis was visiting the Black Sea port of Odessa when a Russian missile hit the infrastructure close enough for the leaders to actually see the strike. The attack occurred at an estimated 500 to 800 meter distance from the delegations. Volodymyr Zelensky and the Greek Prime Minister heard a blast today as they finished their tour of war-torn Odessa. Zelensky said the explosion caused an unknown number of dead and wounded. Russian officials made no immediate comment. Foreign leaders have made numerous trips to Ukraine and they occasionally have had to take refuge in shelters when air raid sirens sound. Zelensky showed Mitsotakis around the destruction in Odessa where in the most recent major Russian attack, 12 people, including five children, were killed when debris from a Russian drone hit an apartment block on March the 2nd. Mitsotakis said Odessa held a special place in Greek history, as it is the place where the Filiki Itaria organization was founded and fought for Greek independence from Ottoman rule in the 19th century. Now, as this occurred, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had said China and Russia have forged a new paradigm of major country relations that is entirely different from the obsolete mode of Cold War approach. Wang told a press conference which was held on the sidelines of the ongoing second session of the 14th National People's Congress, which has China's top legislature, that on the basis of non-alliance, non-confrontation and not targeting any third party, China and Russia strive for lasting good neighborliness and friendship to seek to deepen their comprehensive strategic coordination. For more on this story, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Nirandi Gamage from Kursk in Russia. Nirandi? Yes, Sanradi. China and Russia had declared a no-limits partnership in February 2022 when Putin visited Beijing just days before he sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine 
triggering the deadliest land war in Europe since World War II. Wong insisted that China has always maintained an objective and fair stance on the Ukraine conflict, emphasizing that Beijing continues to insist on promoting peace. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relationship between China and Russia. The two sides will jointly initiate the China-Russia year of culture and bilateral relationship faces new opportunities to develop. With Russia taking the rotating chair of BRICS this year and China taking off the chair of Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the second half of this year, the two sides said they will strengthen the international and multilateral coordination and safeguard regional and global security and stability. Back to you, Amrani. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Nirandi Gamage from Kursk in Russia. We're still on the updates of the press briefing now, as China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi had also said that the U.S. continues to hold the wrong perception of China, and the accusations have reached an unimaginable level, despite some progress since Presidents Joe Biden and Xi Jinping had met last November. Tensions between the two superpowers have slightly eased since Biden and Xi staged their landmark summit in San Francisco last November. But they remain in an uneasy detent ahead of the U.S. election this year, which could see China hawk Donald Trump return to the White House. Washington has repeatedly stated its desire to put a flow under the relationship after its spiral to its worst in decades, last year over issuing including Taiwan, tech competition, trade and elite Chinese spy balloon shoot down by the U.S. off East Coast. China alleges the U.S. is trying to contain and suppress its high-tech development and industrial policy. Beijing also faces ongoing geopolitical confrontations on multiple fronts, including Europe on trade and Ukraine war, Japan on variety of issues, and the Philippines over the South China Sea, a regional hotbed competing territorial claims. And over in neighboring India now, PM Narendra Modi is on his first visit to the Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley since revoking the region's semi-autonomous status in 2019. Modi will address a rally in Srinagar just weeks before India's general election dates are announced. Reports say that his Bharatiya Janata Party will mobilize thousands of people to attend the event amid tight security. An armed revolt against Indian rule in the disputed territory has claimed tens of thousands of lives since the 1980s. Kashmir was divided after India and Pakistan gained independence from Britain in 1947. The two nuclear armed states both claim the region in its entirety and have fought two wars over it in the decades since. Revoking part of the Indian constitution that allowed Indian administered Kashmir, special status had been a poll promise and Mr Modi's government announced the move soon after he won re-election in 2019. Article 370 had granted significant autonomy to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, including the right to have its own flag, legislature, constitution and laws. It was the only Muslim majority state in India. After the abrogation of Article 370, its 12 million people were divided into two federally administered territories, Jammu and Kashmir, and remote mountains of Ladakh. Mr Modi's visit will set the tone for BJP's campaign in the region for the coming general election, analysts say. Let's go on for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more key global stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The U.S. military had said a Houthi missile attack on a Red Sea merchant ship left several people dead. These are the first fatalities reported since the Houthis began strikes against shipping in one of the world's busiest sea lanes in November. Yemen's Houthis claimed responsibility for the attack with a military spokesperson confirming it in a televised address. The attack set the Greek-owned, Barbados-flagged ship True Confidence ablaze around 50 nautical miles off the coast of Yemen's port of Aden. They have said they are acting in solidarity with Palestinians to oppose Israel's military actions in Gaza. Britain and the United States have been launching retaliatory strikes against the Houthis, and the confirmation of fatalities could lead to pressure for stronger military action. Four days ago, a UK-owned bulk carrier became the first ship to sink as a result of a Houthi attack, after floating for two weeks with severe damage from a missile strike. All crew were safely evacuated. While the Houthis say they would attack vessels with links to the United Kingdom, the United States, and Israel, 
Shipping industry sources say all ships could be at risk. Over in the UK now, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt visited a builder's merchant in London just hours after a fresh UK budget announcement. Hunt said during the visit that the tax cuts implemented in the new budget would fire up the economy. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Clifford Ferreira from Yorkshire in the UK. Clifford? Yes, I'm Radhi. Britain's Conservative government announced a £10 billion cut in labour taxes pairing emergency reserves to pay for it. In what could be the last budget ahead of an election, it looks doomed to lose. Opposition Labour Party leader K.O. Stamer accused Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt of having maxed out the nation's credit card and said the budget plan was the desperate act of a party that has failed. Hunt cut the rate of social security contributions by two percentage points for the second time just over three months in a move worth several hundred pounds a year to some 27 million workers. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. And on the road to the White House tonight, for the first time in nearly 70 years, the U.S. will have a presidential rematch. As we reported to you when the news broke just yesterday, U.S. Republican presidential candidate nominee Nikki Haley is no longer running in the race, losing more than 20 other contests to Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump. Haley's exit has cleared the stage for a Trump-Biden rematch in November's election. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. On Wednesday, the morning after Super Tuesday, Nikki Haley, the former South Carolina governor and ambassador to the Don't United Nations for a period during Donald Trump's presidency, ended her race for the White House. She won the primaries in Washington, D.C. on Sunday and Vermont on Super Tuesday, but lost more than 20 other contests to Donald Trump. On Super Tuesday alone, Trump won 14 of the 15 Republican nominating contests. Bowing out, Haley emphasized that it was important to continue U.S. global leadership. She had said throughout her campaign that the United States must help Ukraine against Russian aggression, which goes against Trump's stance on foreign affairs. She did not endorse Donald Trump, which means her supporters will now likely have to choose between the former and incumbent presidents in November. Just as Haley was conceding the race, Trump posted on social media that she had been trounced on Super Tuesday before inviting her supporters to back him. However, the Democrats' presidential frontrunner Joe Biden praised Haley for daring to speak the truth about Trump and extended his own invitation to her supporters. Haley's exit sets up a rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in the November election, which will be the first repeat U.S. presidential contest since 1956. Both candidates have faced criticism with Biden's age and Trump's legal issues, something that voters will be left to ponder. And tonight in Georgia, the allegations against District Attorney Fani Willis that has threatened to derail the Georgia election interference case against Donald Trump are now spilling over from the courthouse to the state house. Take a look. Taking center stage, Ashley Merchant, the defense attorney leading the charge to have Willis removed from the case after Merchant alleged the DA financially benefited from a personal relationship with special prosecutor Nathan Wade. I've been a criminal defense attorney for 20 years. Today, Merchant spoke before a Republican-led state Senate committee and, not bound by the rules of the courtroom, revealed new details about her early conversations with Terrence Bradley, Wade's former law partner and divorce attorney, turned reluctant witness. During his courtroom testimony last week, Bradley denied any direct knowledge of when the relationship began. Today, Merchant told lawmakers it was Bradley who first reached out to her with details. 
Both Willis and Wade have denied any wrongdoing, saying their relationship began after Wade was hired by the DA's office. Today's panel has no power to punish Willis and no bearing on the court case itself or the motion to remove her from prosecution. Republicans say the committee has a duty to investigate. But Democrats call the entire process politically motivated. Today, Willis, also at the state capitol to qualify to run for re-election, said this about the committee. I think that people are angry because I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to stand up um, for justice, no matter who is the person that um, may have done wrong in Fulton County. And so they can continue on with their games and I'm going to continue to do the work of the people. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has ordered heightened readiness for war. This is according to state media, which released images related to his visit. And Kim was seen just a day earlier inspecting troops at a major military base. And the broadcast also said that they were training under conditions simulating actual war. Kim was also quoted as saying the military must, quote, dynamically usher in a new heyday of intensifying the war preparations in line with the requirements of the prevailing situation. Kim's tour of the base, the location of which was not identified, comes after the start of annual combined military drills by U.S. and South Korean forces on Monday in the South, with twice the number of troops taking part compared to last year. Pyongyang urged the Allies to stop their drills, calling them rehearsals for war. Seoul and Washington say the exercises are defensive and a response to the North's threats. North Korean state media did not mention whether Kim explicitly referred to the joint U.S.-South Korean drills in his remarks Wednesday at the military base. And on some tech news tonight, Elon Musk has sued the nonprofit OpenAI and its co-founder Sam Altman over the company allegedly moving to a for-profit company. OpenAI responded to the claims by releasing emails between the company and Musk. Tonight, tech giants at war, billionaire Elon Musk taking on OpenAI, complaining the nonprofit he helped fund is now a for-profit entity with ties to Microsoft. Musk is now suing the company and its founders, alleging in part that its entire development is built in secrecy. Now OpenAI is moving to dismiss Elon's claims, releasing emails that allegedly show the tech founder agreed that parts of the company's science could be closed. At one point in 2018, Elon reportedly suggested a merger with Tesla to stay competitive. We may wish it otherwise, but Tesla is the only path that could even hope to hold a candle to Google. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have more art news for you tonight. Dancing light beams and colorful digital displays were among the dazzling array of artworks showcased at the UAE's annual Art Dubai event. Now in its 17th iteration, the fair exhibits works from more than 120 galleries across the world, featuring digital, contemporary and modern works. Canadian-Korean contemporary artist Krista Kim worked on an installation dubbed Heart Space 2024, which is commissioned by Julius Bayer for Art Dubai. It's an immersive installation that is the very first biometric AI generative collaborative artwork in history. The work uses algorithms of people's heartbeats, transforming it into a tapestry of waveforms and colors. Held in Dubai over three days, the art event also includes educational talks, some geared at students, live performances and also workshops. And finally tonight. I wonder if you recall, but a month or so ago, we spoke about a fuzzy home intruder, a squirrel that was trying to commit an act of felony, uh, so to speak. Well, apparently those of the animal kingdom have taken after the brave little guy and have begun their own crime spree. This time, it's a masked bandit. Take a look. He's a big son too. Indianapolis cops are used to capturing intruders, but they're usually of the human sort. Officers arrived at a residence to find out their robbery suspect was a raccoon. Police knew they were out of their usual depth. Oh, that's nice. Well, we'll do what we can to help you. 
Body camera video captured around 4 o'clock in the morning shows officers surveying the home that was broken into by a masked bandit. Oh yeah, there he is. Yep. He's a big son too. Where's the other corner? Yeah, he is. Dude, hey, easy, easy, partner. Using stellar negotiation techniques, the officer tried to talk down the suspect. It's all right, buddy. It's okay. All right, we well, got a big raccoon in here, just so you know. This raccoon didn't take direction well. Come on, just shut the to evade capture, the cornered trash panda climbed the wall and a refrigerator. Keep your door shut. Keep it shut. That refrigerator was the raccoon's temporary haven, but ultimately his downfall. He's doing pull-ups on the casing. Officers tried. He might be in the fridge, I don't know. And tried again. Damn it. Yes. The broom got <laughs> Yeah. He got stuck on the broom. But the suspect was finally apprehended on the third attempt. Got him. Indianapolis Metro Police say the large raccoon intruder was released into the wild. Masked bandit indeed. This trash panda sure put up quite a good fight. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good night.